until after we say that if it goes through this time. So it's going to the same clockwork sequence. We ready to go live? We're on, we're on. Okay. Good. Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Good afternoon. Good to see you again. It is Sivan 15. Shabbat, Lunar Shabbat, Sivan 15. And it's the full moon Shabbat. So we have quite a bit of power and anointing available to us uh, at the beginning of at sundown last night actually this power is available a day or two before to a day or two after uh, the Shabbat as well well today's subject is biblical anthropomorphic healing B-A-H ba, biblical anthropomorphic healing but before we begin as scripture uh, commands we should blow the holy shofar before we go into battle. We're also to blow the holy shofar um, on Shabbat, on the Moedims, and feast days. So let's fulfill that commandment of scripture and blow the holy shofar. Baruch Atah, Yahweh, Eloheinu Malek, Ho'olam, Asher, Kitsunu, Omisvatah, Vitzivanu, Al Misfah, Shofar, Vishem Yeshua, Amin. Scatter your enemies, O oh Lord. introduce myself I didn't give any introduction I'm Rabbi Vincent P Adams and I'm co-founder of Etz High M mm -hmm. Temple and Energy Center along with my lovely wife Navia Leslie Adams and our ministry is 100% about healing and health helping you to you know, heal your, your mind and emotions as well as your body and your land or your finances and economics. Because if your finances and economics or your land, as the Bible refers to it, is not healed, pretty soon you're going to be sick in your body as well. Because you're going to be sick in your, you know, if you don't have, if you can't pay the bills, you're going to be upset and if you're upset you're going to be sick sooner or later all three work together so that's the focus of our ministry everything is to bring about healing and that's our our main focus you know some ministries uh, they want to help the homeless they want to win souls I mean we do all of that also but our main focus is healing. So without further ado, go to John. No, not John. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2. When you get there, let me know you're there. Say amen when you get there nice and loud and strong. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2.
I got I have a, a couple of foundational scriptures that I want to go over before we really get into the material. Um, I'm often say it loud. Amen. Okay. Amen. All right. I'm often criticized uh, by people who will say to me, well, "How come you just don't do it the way Yeshua did? It? You know, do it the way Jesus did." It. Um, where is that in the Bible? Because they don't, you know, they can't understand concepts. They're waiting for step one, step two, step three. You know, the Bible is not a manual on how to put together a bicycle. You're not going to have step one, step two, step three. You have to be able to understand and discern concepts. And that's what you don't violate. You don't violate or contradict biblical concepts. But you may not see something in the Bible um, as you see it in the world today. That doesn't mean that it's not biblical. The question is, does it go against biblical teaching in any way? That's right. Okay? So let's, uh, let's take a look at Proverbs 25 to kind of answer that question of my critics or those of you who may be, you know, skeptical. It's okay to be skeptical. It's, you know, a healthy dose of skepticism leads to investigation and knowledge. So that's good. Proverbs 25, verse 2. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings to search it out. Some translations say the glory of kings, the glory of God to conceal it, and the glory of kings to search it out. You know, all of you should think of yourselves as kings or as royalty, you know, kings and queens. And God has put things in his holy word and hid them because he wants you to search it out. He wants you to take time to read, study, ponder, wonder, investigate. Because that's how, you know, you learn. If someone just tells you step one, step two, step three, okay, boom, you're through with it. You're not going to spend any time studying it. You're not going to spend any time absorbing the material. And let it become a part of you so that you can get deeper into it. Okay? So, it's a glory. You know, I'm going to today show you what I have searched out. Well, I'm going to show you what God has hidden in the scriptures and how I have searched it out. I think you'll be amazed. You know, there is a an theological axiom or adage that says that the new, meaning the New Testament, is in the old concealed. Old meaning Old Testament. The new is in the old concealed. The old is in the new revealed okay Amen. we're going to demonstrate that to you today as well as some other uh, biblical truths and facts that the Lord has hidden in his word all right the other criticism why don't you just do it heal or just do it the way Yeshua did you know I do okay go to my answer is I'm not supposed to okay Go to John chapter 14, verse 2. Most Christians, John chapter 14, verse 2. Get this amen for me. Let me know you're with me. Are you ready to go? Amen. Okay, real good, real good. Nice and strong. Let somebody know you're up in here, okay? <laughs> 
I'm not going to bite anybody. At least not until I get my new Stobrault front teeth. <laughs> okay. And because, because of COVID-19, I can't go get my new teeth. So everybody is safe for right now. You don't have to worry about me biting you. So speak up. Okay, let me see here what's going on. I want okay. John, you way too far in the back of the book there, Boaz, to be looking at John. Go to the index and look up John. No, not oh you were looking okay, you were looking at first John. Just just John. I saw him almost up in Revelation. I said, boy, you a long way off. <laughs> it might say Yokana because you've John got a hip and brave root. Okay, since you guys got it, you're all using the same Bible. Just tell them the page number. Okay. All right. Okay. It said, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. You know, that's an illusion to the fact that we're multidimensional beings. That, as the scripture says, we are um, co-seated with Moshiach, co-seated with Christ in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father. We're there right now. We're here and we're there at the same time. Okay. Let's see here. I think that I want, let's see, what is that? 14, down 14 to say to him, Lord, show us the flower and stuff. This is not, I hate it when I do that. I knew, um, okay. Go down to verse 11. Okay, I was in the right chapter. Go to verse 11. Mm -hmm. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the very works sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And he prepares a place for us, so that we have the same authority that he had on earth. Because we're going to be in the same place, a place of authority. What is above is more powerful than what is beneath. Okay, I want to take a look at the original Aramaic of that of that word greater okay notice I didn't say Greek because the New Testament was translated from Hebrew and Aramaic into Greek Greek was not the original language so you will miss quite a bit by doing that okay truly Say I to you, whoever believes, I'm reading word for word in the Aramaic, whoever believes in me works these that I do also he will do and more okay and more doesn't say greater it just says in the original language he who believes on me or in me the works that I do he will do also and more doesn't say greater just says more it's gonna it's gonna be some addition in other words 
you are not going to see every sign and wonder that a believer does in their ministry. You are not going to see it word for word in the Bible. That doesn't mean that it's demonic. Right. And more, these will he do. Right. Because I go to the Father. I go. So when you see me do something, or see one of our ministers here at Etiam Tree of Life, help someone get healed and you don't have a biblical reference for that modality that you just witnessed or heard about, it doesn't mean that it's demonic. I'm simply doing the works that Yeshua did, which was to heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, and make disciples of men and nations. Just because you don't see a step one, two, three in the Bible that I'm following doesn't mean it's a bad thing. So I wanted to give you those two scriptures. I, I'm searching things out. I'm uncovering things that may or may not have been edified and delineated before now. What's the revelation? Kind of. From what you're saying, <clears throat> I got a revelation. For some reason in my head, I had the image of Yeshua when he took the clay for the man who was blind and formed clay out of it. Mm -hmm. It does not tell us how he did that. He did it because he is God. He is fully God and fully man. Mm -hmm. But if God tells you to do something that isn't necessarily in the Bible, to form something, to do something, to heal another person, then so be it. I think the clay is an example. I don't think the clay, the way he did that, is something he's telling us to do the same way. Okay. Yeah. Before he did it, <laughs> no one had ever seen that done before. I would think not. Right. Okay. It was a new, more than likely, it was a new thing. But God's going to tell people how to do something that no one else may have done before. Exactly. And there are some uh, preachers and theologians who say, he didn't just scoop up some dirt, spit in it, and pack it over his eye. Some theologians say that man was born without eyeballs. And that what Yeshua actually did was take some dirt, spit into it, pack it, and form eyeballs. Or little round balls. And stick that into his socket. And they became eyeballs. I've heard I've heard it several times. I didn't just make that up. Some some uh, preachers have actually preached that and taught that mm -hmm. that they believe that that's what was really going on, and that's consistent with some other uh, rabbinical teachings that we normally find in Kabbalah. That's another thing. You know, I participated in a discussion on Facebook. Uh, uh, for the past week or two where, you know, someone asked a question. It started because someone asked the question if they should learn Kabbalah or Kabbalah. And most of the folks were like, oh, no, never, no, you know. And none of them, um, virtually none of them have ever read any Kabbalistic text or read the Zohar or the Sefer Yitzhak or anything. Mm -hmm. I've no only had... Of anything. Yeah, I... I Two people out of almost a hundred people said that they had some familiar, familiar, familiarity. Familiar. See, I need that. <laughs> I need. I need that Stobrock teeth. Familiar. Lose some teeth and see how hard it is to form certain <laughs> letters and words. Okay. Um, they have. <laughs> No relationship with the Zohar whatsoever. Okay. Never read it. I, I don't know uh, what their association has been. But out of about 100 people or so, only two claim to have some idea. And one just said that they 
met somebody who practiced Kabbalah in Hollywood and they were a child molester, so therefore, you know. It's all about oh, yeah. people grouping. All the child molesters people. we have in the pulpit in Christianity. Right. You know, we're still Christian. It doesn't matter what they did. But anyway, so more, I'm just doing more works. I, yeah, I, I don't want anybody to say I'm being arrogant. You know, if I quote King James and say greater works. So I'll quote the original Aramaic. I'm doing the works of Yeshua and some more, as the scripture said. So you've got those two as my foundation for going forward now, okay? So kind of explains what I'm, um, what I'm going to do. Go to Genesis chapter 1, 26. Verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Okay. All right. And God said, Let us make man in our image. God. And God said, Let us make man in our image. After our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So whose image are we made in? God's image. Okay. What's the title? Biblical anthropomorphic healing. Anthropomorphic healing. Biblical Anthro for morphic healing. I can say that. Let me see if I familiar <laughs> familiarity. It was hard. I got it that time. Boy, okay. Poor people who study you ever see people who study try to get a word out sometime. Whew. I had a man, he turned out he he was my frat brother. And I was working in the camera shop in Chicago and he came in and he was actually in med school at the University of Chicago. You know, Chicago, University of Chicago is a very prestigious school. And he was telling me how hard it was for him to get into med school there. They didn't want to let him in because he stuttered so bad. And he was trying to tell me something. And I swear, my frat brother, I think his eyes rolled back in his head trying to get a word out of him. I mean... Like he was trying to deadlift, you know, 600 pounds or something, you know, so it'd be quite difficult. I hope he made it through and he's a doctor now yeah. and everything, yeah, okay. But um, we see that we're made in God's image. Mm -hmm. And this is, the title of this is Biblical Anthropomorphic Healing, because that's our focus at Ed's I Am. That's what God has called me to do, Okay to focus on healing. And if ever we need healing, we've always needed it desperately. But ever, if ever we have needed, we need it now during COVID this COVID-19 pandemic. Not just because we need protection from this virus, from this plague, but we need healing from the results of it. We need healing in our economics. We need quite a bit of emotional healing. You know, yeah. child abuse is on the rise. Domestic violence is on the rise. People are killing each other. We're really seeing how sick our society is from this. Policemen are kneeling on people's throat. Mm -hmm. Rioters and protesters are burning, looting. You know, several people have been killed during what should have been peaceful protests. All kind of things. They, other day I was watching the news, they uh, shoved a 75-year-old man down to the ground and busted his head open. And then when one cop went to kind of look at him, the guy stopped him and told him to keep on. All kind of, we, you know, we, we need healing. Okay? Now, Get a shot up there of 
the yo hey va hey This is called, this is the name of the Father, Yahweh. Yo, starting on the right here. Yo, he, vav, he. Starting from right to left. Four letters. It's called the Tetragrammaton. Okay. And the Jews call it the Shem Hemiphoresh. Shem meaning name. <coughs> okay, let's keep it quiet, keep it down. Tetragrammaton or the Shem Hemiphoresh. We're made in God's image. We're even, we're even made in the image of his name. Rabbinical teaching says that the Shem Hemiphoresh, or the Tetragrammaton, that that is the actual face of God. If you take that yo, that first letter that you saw, if you wrote it, instead of writing it out horizontally, or parallel with the floor, if you wrote it vertically, with the yo being at the top, and then you took that hey, you know, that went like this, mm -hmm. and you put the tip of that yod in the center of that hey going across, then you took that vav, which is like a nail, and you stuck it up into the center of the hey between the, you know, the two bars that are coming down, and then took the last hey and let the tip of that valve that's coming out of you know the I bottom part of I the hay yeah. it would look just like a man you can you could you can go on the internet and see that all over the place there are all kind of examples of it on the internet that's what it looks like okay looks like the image of a man pass it around let them see it Okay. Yo he vav he. The image of a man. The yo becomes the head and the neck, and the he is the shoulders and the arms. Then the vav becomes the torso, and then the he, the final he, becomes the waist, the hips, and the legs. That's, that's an example of anthropomorphic, having the characteristics and similarity of human form or human characteristics. Anthropomorphic, yod he vav he. There is even a method of healing if you have, say, a problem um, neurological with the head by meditating on the yod and repeating the yo slowly like a uh, mantra will help heal that problem okay now let's take a look to my left here the 10 rope. okay is that readily visible leslie the 10 rope? sorry i was posted okay we have here the 10 rope. It has several names. Move your feet, please. Okay. <laughs> ten sephiro. You see ten spears. You see a dotted line here for one. That's, I'll explain. I have explained that already in several teachings over the years. Uh, but it's considered a pseudo sephiro. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not there. Won't get into that. Look at some of my old teachings. You have ten. The first one, or the lowest one, this is actually the tenth one, is called Malhut. Then, you want me to hold it like that? No, I'm trying to get the glare out because this one is totally washed out. Okay. So that's at the bottom. I'll tilt it, you know. Okay. You can go back and sit down. I'll tilt it as needed. The first one down there at the bottom is called Malhut. Then directly above that is Yasad. Then you have Hod. And directly across, Nisak. Tiferet in the center. Then you have Gura, Hesed, Bina, Hakma, <coughs> excuse me, and Keter. That's the Tennessee for Row. Okay, is it still? It's good. Okay. It's All right. Now, this also has 
several names. It's called the Ten Sefirot. It's called Etzayim, or the Tree of Life. It's called the Body of Yeshua. Okay? And it represents our body as well as Yeshua's body. It's anthropomorphic. B Hatma is our right brain. Bina is our left brain. And Keter is our skull. Hesed is our right arm and shoulder. Guvara is our left arm and shoulder. Tiferet is our torso, the center of our body. Hod and Netzach are our waist. Okay. Yasad is our sexual organs. And Malhut is our feet. Anthropomorphic. The body of Yeshua, the tree of life, and us all in one. It also represents our solar system as well. I don't want to take the time to go into that, but all of the planets, as well as Earth and the moon, are represented in here, in order, exactly as they are out there in space in the universe. So it represents all these things all at once. It also represents our seven auras and our seven chakras. So it's anthropomorphic in that sense as well. It represents us on several different, you know, physical anatomy, arms, head, torso, body, legs, and also our spiritual components, or I shouldn't say spiritual, energetic components of the seven chakras as well as the seven auras. This also represents the Shem Hemiforesh, or the Tetragrammaton, or the yod heh vav -He. Okay? The head, Keter, Hakma, and Bina is the Yod, Guvara, and Hesed represent arms and shoulders, or the Hay. Tiferet represents Vav, or the Remember the torso. Okay? Yasad or Malhut or all of that. The whole hips, Nisakas, and Hod and Yasad is our lower area. The hips and our sexual organs. All of that, you know, by the Vav. And then the hay represents, the final hay represents Malhut. So they correspond to each other. The Tetragrammaton or the yod heh vav -Hey, to the ten c And both are anthropomorphic. Okay? Having human or bodily attributes and characteristics. Okay? All right. So I wanted to show you that before we um, we moved on here, okay. Let's go now to let's go to Revelations chapter twenty-two, verse one. Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapter twenty-two, verse one, the last book of the Bible, the last chapter in the Bible, chapter twenty-two. Verses 1 and 2. <coughs> you get this? Say amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. What's the page number? Let everybody know. 970. 970. Okay. All right. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. Clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God 
and of the Lamb. One throne, but God the Father and God the Son seated in that one throne. That's the oneness of God. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruit, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Okay, now I'm going to read that in another verse. This is the version by Andrew Gabriel Roth. And it, it is by far, in my opinion, in most uh, Hebrew roots people agree with me that this is the best translation of the Brick Shah there is. Especially from the um, the original Aramaic. And you'll catch a, a little added revelation here, okay? And he showed me a river of living water, transparent as crystal, which proceeded from the throne of Elohim and the Lamb. And in the middle of its broad avenue, and near the river, on this side and on that, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, yielding one of its fruits each month. Okay, it bore, it's a little added, Reverend, it bore 12 types of fruit, but only one fruit is available each month. Okay, let's pick this scripture apart. Let's exegete, do exegesis on this scripture from an anthropomorphic perspective. Okay? All right. This is exegetical anthropomorphic. Very good. Couldn't have said it better. <laughs> Especially without my stove off teeth. Okay. Now, I just showed you the tree of life. Okay. We call the tree of life the three column system. You got one column, you got the central column, and then you have the left. This is the right column, this is the left, and this is the central. Verse 1 says, Out of the throne of the Father and the Lamb, okay, flows a river of life, clear as crystal. The river of life is the Holy Spirit. So, you have three in one throne. You have the Father, Yahweh, you have Yeshua, and then coming out of the throne is the river of life or the Holy Spirit or the three column system. The ten sea for Rome. So the scripture becomes anthropomorphic with that description. Amen? You see that? Okay. Now, Sister Leslie and myself, we have been studying, formally studying, Oriental medicine uh, for the past uh, three years now. We took a year off. We'll be going back this fall. And so we've actually completed about a year, year and a half, because we've gone part-time here and there. In acupuncture, there are what's called meridians. There are 12 meridians on each side of the body. And they're mirror images of each other. There are three along the inside of the arm. There are three along the outside of the arm. On both sides. Mirror images of each other. There are three on the inside of the leg. There are three on the outside of the leg. There is an energy reservoir running down the center of the body. Okay? Straight down, splitting us right in half, running down into our genitalia, and 
straight up the back, straight up the center of the spine. The front is a energetic reservoir for the yin organs on the inside. Yin generally refers to soft, okay? The back, you know, our back is hard. The back is an energetic res uh, reservoir for the yang meridians or yang organs. Same thing, same thing on the inside of the leg going all the way down and on the outside. Here we see the energetic reservoir coming out of the throne and running down the center of the street. On either side is a tree of life yielding 12 manner of fruit. The 12 bilateral meridians of the body. Anthropomorphic. And it says it has leaves. The leaves are for healing. So here we see that herbology is a God-given component of healing. Because the purpose of the tree of life is to heal. And there are 12 manner of fruit. The 12 manner of fruit is the organs that are represented by the meridians. Okay, I just hope this, this is the lung meridian, right. this is the heart, this is the pericardium, okay, on the back, well, you got it large intestine. Lung is on the outside. No, I did. No, inside. lung is on the lung, inside. Justin, no, I said lung, pericardium, and heart. Lung is on the top. The small, intestine? small intestine is on the back, is yawn. You just fail. Okay. okay. And interrupted me to do that, too. Small intestine is on the back, on the bottom, on the little finger side. Then we have, what, like you said, the sand jowl. And then large intestine up here on the top. On the yin side, we have lung, pericardium, and heart. Okay. Now I've got my point. Some of the 12 matter of fruit. Okay, yeah, still, or would I, I had a train of thought someplace oh, I was right. going. You got the 12 matter of fruit. Whatever, the whatever, the whatever, 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 okay. The fruit on the meridians. So, we have an indication, a clue, a hint, that we should study the meridian system to learn how to heal. It's a biblical way... Acupuncture is actually a part of biblical healing. Studying it, I have found that since I've been studying acupuncture and other topics related to Oriental medicine, I understand the Bible better. Okay? Also, those people who will tell you that astrology is from the devil. We have the indication right here in verse 2 that astrology is very biblical. Because what does it say? It says every month one of these fruits is more active or it produces one of those 12 manners of fruit that's each right. month. And that's, that's really good. right there in the Bible. Say it again, please. Okay. Those people who will tell you that astrology is from the devil are just wrong. They're, they're repeating what's been repeated in Christianity. Uh, they got start, it got started with the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church wanted to control the people. It didn't want the people to have any power. It wanted the people, the peasants, and everyone else to bring their wealth, their money, their influence into the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church. It makes perfect sense. And so it was that lie was perpetuated so that whatever you needed, you would go to the priest or to the Pope if you had that type of access 
for everything, and you bring money with you. St. Francis of Assisi, one of my historical heroes of the church, visited the Pope once, and the Pope took him to the treasure room to show St. Francis all the gold and silver that the, the Catholic Church had. And he joked. He said, gold and silver, he said, we can no longer say gold and silver have we not. Ha 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 ha. We can no longer say gold and silver have we not. Do you know what St. Francis said to him? Yes, but we can also no longer say rise, take up your bed, and walk. Amen. Yeah. We've lost it. We've traded um, spirituality for materialism. Could I go ahead and read out of the Restoration Scriptures? Name edition go ahead. Scripture? Go ahead. Why not? Revelation 22 and verses 1 and 2. Just so you all know, what he's saying is very, very clear to us because we study Chinese medicine. It says, In the midst of it, on either side of the river, there was an SPM that bore 12 kinds of fruits, which is representative of each organ. And yielded their fruits every moon. So you know they're talking about every month. Oh, you Lunar Shabbat. You cannot say that it's uh, some kind of seasonal thing, you know, for fruit to be yielded on a tree if you're looking at it, you know. Oh, that's a good point to make. It wasn't just, it was, uh, wasn't season, that strawberries right, were in season. spring, summer, and fall, but for every moon? You can explain very well, Vince, better than I, about what that really means. Every moon, you do Tai Chi, and you have to know if you're trying to strengthen any type of organ meridian, you have to do your Tai Chi at the time of the day. Well, that that's true. That's true. What Susie is, is alluding to there. And um, in Oriental medicine, you don't treat a person say in June the same way you would treat them in January remembering that certain meridians certain internal internal organs are more active or more ready to be treated in oriental medicine basically you would treat the lungs you would put extra energy into the lungs to prepare them to withstand the winter, the cold and flu season. You just don't do acupuncture when someone is sick. You do it all year round to prepare them for everything that happens seasonally. So, astrology, you know, there's something you probably heard of, it's called the I Ching. Well, the correct pronunciation is Yi Ching. Right. Okay, but most Westerners call it the I Ching. And Christians will say, oh, it's from the devil. That's divination. You're trying to predict the future. And the Lord gave me a revelation on that just this morning when I was meditating on that. in terms of biblical astrology. Who you are, who we are, our destiny is written in our, the Lord has written who we are and our destiny in our DNA. You have been fearfully and wonderfully made to fulfill the plans of God and it's written in your DNA so that as you grow, you'll manifest that. What's happening with the I Ching? The I Ching is based on 64 hexagrams. The I Ching is based on your DNA. You have 64 codons. C-O-D-O-N-S. This is the substance that's in your DNA that makes you who you are. And there are 64 of them. So cool. no, no, no. <laughs> when you 
throw the coins in the I Ching. You, you're supposed to take some coins and throw them. And then, based on those three coins, heads, tails, you write out a hexagram. Whether it's two dashes, one line, and then two dashes again, there are 64 of them. Through your intent, what is really going on there is that through intent, through the use of this ancient technology of oriental medicine, you are reading or analyzing the energetic signature of your own DNA. So therefore, you can use this in order to design a treatment plan of when and where to place needles in a person's body for healing based on their personal individual DNA and essence of their life. That's what's going on. It's not some spooky spirit. Okay? That you're calling from the pit of hell uh, to reveal the future to you. That, you know, the word, div you know, everybody, Christians, the word divination is a dirty word. Everybody doesn't look at that word as you know, being demonic or whatever. But, you know, di divination is actually a archaic word to use. What's actually going on is the deciphering of your DNA, of that energy signature that is unique to you. That's what's going on. That's what's happening. That's what's going on based on your intent or your faith. And if you're spiritually pure, so that you don't get any interference. And then you read what the description of the hexagram that you just drew out based on the tossing of the coins. And then you still have to depend on the Holy Spirit to interpret it to you properly. So you need to be pure in heart. You need to be a biblical scholar to use this. Biblical, so you know what biblical astrology really is? Okay. In order to properly properly do biblical astrology, the 12 tribes of Israel, those 12 sons, when you read that, you know, each one of the 12 tribesmen is associated with a particular biblical month. In order, you know, right now, if you're, you know, born a Gemini, they say you're this, you're that, the Gemini female is this. The Gemini male is that. Biblical astrology, on the other hand, would say in order to understand the attributes and characteristics and propensities and proclivities of a Gemini, you have to read the description of that particular tribesman in the body, in the Bible. So that you can get an idea of what type of person was he. Then you'll have an idea of other people born in the same month. What their character and personality is like. That's just the beginning point. You also have to read the entire Bible. And whatever it says. See this is, the why, the Bi this is why the Bible says it. You notice when you read the Bible, they say there was a man named Jonathan 
who was of the tribe of Levite or whatever. They, anytime you have a man's name in the Bible, especially, uh, I would say, in Torah and throughout, you know, the, the scriptures, it'll tell you what tribe he's from. Why? What good is it? Why do you need to know what tribe he's from? Okay, it says a lot about purpose. But if you read the entire Bible, and every time you see a man's name, and it gives his tribe, and you write down what he did, you know, what he did in the Bible, what he did, yeah. what tribe he's from, and you do that for everyone on, on say, who's a Levite or whatever, you're going to get a picture of what Levites do. And how they act. Then you go to the next one. Do the same thing for all 12. What does, what does that mean? In order to do biblical astrology, you got to know the Bible. But if you're really interested in astrology, you have to study the Bible and know it like the back of your hand. That's what is trying if you want that knowledge yes. okay <laughs> if you want that knowledge if you want to uncover what God has hid that's how you what you're gonna have it's gonna force you to study the Word of God okay you trying to tell me something honey <laughs> No, I, no, I wasn't thinking of you, but not now that you said it. Okay, you 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 get it. I wasn't thinking. But I'm just trying. I'm really. I know you weren't. Preaching to the people. That's the purpose of biblical astrology. In Oriental medicine, they talk about uh, constitutional type. What type of person someone is, and you. You know, it's based on the five elements. You don't uh, treat a metal person the way you treat a water person. You, you know, individual uh, lives thing. No clear like fire, wood, you know. The Bible is, is, you know, a little bit more specific. Okay, with the 12 tribes. The 12 manner of fruit. The meridian. The, the 12 bilateral meridians and the two unilateral. It's really is one flow, but they call the front. When it's when it runs down the front, they call it the ren. When it runs up the back, because it, it runs down the front and up the back. Continuous loop. When it goes down the front, they call it the ren meridian. When it's going up the back, it's called the do meridian. Ren and do. Okay? And that's what is referred to as the river of life. And you notice crystals are involved. Crystals nourish the 12 bilateral meridians and the fruit and the organs that are associated with the 12 meridians. And we know the leaves are from, you know, should be nourished by the um, crystals as well. Your fruit, your vegetables. Let's fast forward. Let's, let's go back to the future. Go to Genesis. Go back to Genesis. Um, I think it's Genesis 2. Let me, what do I have written down here? Genesis 2, 12. Amen. Start at uh, verse 10. Genesis 2. We're going to read to 10. Genesis 2, chapter 2, 
verse 10. Start re I'm going to start reading at verse 10. I'm going to show you something here. Ah, oh boy, this, okay. Genesis chapter 2. Verse 10, okay. Now here's uh, something I caught. Holy Spirit showed this to me. And a river went, went out of Eden to water the garden. How does a river, don't we call it the Garden of Eden? Mm -hmm. But here it says, a river went out of Eden to water the garden. How does a river uh, say, uh, how does a, um, a garden get watered by a river that comes out of itself and into itself? A sphere. Huh? A sphere. A what? Yes. A what? A sphere. She said a sphere. You mean it circles and comes back into itself? Mm -hmm. Okay. Possible. Well, just think about that. How the, you know, it's the garden. Most, you know, we refer to Eden as the Garden of Eden. We call that the name of it, right? Mm -hmm. The Garden of Eden. Let's just look at a little bit of... Eden means pleasure. So really what it says here is a river went out of pleasure to water the garden. And garden is called enclosure. So pleasure came out, water came out of pleasure. To water the enclosure. Hmm. All right. Pleasure. Let's see, is there any habitat? Hmm. Okay. I would have to say we have to redefine the Garden of Eden. We have to We're going to do that anthropomorphically. Okay. Redefining the Garden of Eden because the Garden of Eden is a Garden of Pleasure. To me, it's a Garden of Pleasure of God, God's pleasure that He created for us. Okay. But it doesn't say that. It says a, a river went out mm -hmm. of Eden or out of pleasure to water the actual garden. Signifying to me that the source of this water is not from the garden. Where is this coming from? Where is this? Where What and where is Eden? Okay, we know water is coming out of it into the garden. We know that much. But where is Eden? What is Eden? Okay, let's keep reading. A river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Then it gives the name. But we don't, we're not concerned about the name. Okay, now. Let's think of it anthropomorphically. Go back to Revelation chapter 22. Remember Revelation, you don't have to actually go there. Remember Revelation 22 verses 1 and 2. Water is coming out of what? The throne. Can the throne be pleasure? Okay. And it does what? It war remember we're gonna live in the garden again in New Jerusalem. And it waters what? The garden. Okay. S using Revelations twenty two verses one and two, Eden in Genesis chapter two verse ten is the throne of God. What is coming out? Of Eden. Huh? The Ruach HaKodesh. What is coming out of Eden or pleasure. Remember when you have the spirit or the Ruach HaKodesh, you have joy unspeakable. 
we have pleasure. What is coming out of Eden is the Ruach Hokadesh, the Holy Spirit, and that's what watered the garden, what we call the Garden of Eden, or Eden, based on the revelation of Revelation chapter 22, verse 1 and 2. What did I say when we get, began? The new is in the old concealed, and the, con and the old is in the new revealed. And we have that going on here now. Let's go a little further. The name of the first river gives it, okay. It says, and the name of the first is Pason, that is which compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Now that's actually a metaphor for something. I forget what it, what it was. There is Beladium and the Onyx Stone. So in the river, Bedellium and the Onyx Stone. In the river itself are crystals. Just like there's a reference to crystals in the river of life back in Revelations chapter 22 verses 1 and 2. We got same thing going on. Okay? And remember this river that split into four watered the garden. Remember that the two trees of life are watered by that river. There's a tree on either side of the river of life. Mm -hmm. Near the river. Roots of a tree are going to go down deep and they're going to find that water. They're going to tap into that river. So what does this mean? It means that Adam drank water that from a river that contain crystals in it for the nourishment of his body. It means that the plants and the vegetables that were watered by this river from the Holy Spirit were infused or nourished by a river containing crystals. Okay? okay. Now, let's really hit it anthropomorphically. It's split into four heads, right? Yeah. Into four branches. Where did I say, where did I say that the bilateral meridians are? Legs and arms. Four branches. That in Revelations chapter 22 verses 1 and 2 you've got 12 on each side of that river being nourished. In Genesis here alright we know now that it's going into four branches arms and legs coming out of the throne of God here the Tennessee for rope into these branches now let me tell you something about the Tennessee for rope put it on the Tennessee for road again Remember, this is anthropomorphic. Okay, we're on the ten C for row. The ten C for row. You see these Hebrew letters here? There are twenty-two Hebrew letters. There are ten different spheres or C for rows. Ten plus twenty-two is thirty-two. This is referred to also as the thirty-two paths of wisdom. Remember, it represents us. In Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 is about what? Creation. What? Creation. About creation. Not just the physical world that we're in. Also the spirit world is being created also. Okay? 
in Genesis, the rabbis have studied this and broken this out. In Genesis, chapter 1, it is the story of creation. Creating, it is the story of creating us. Remember, this represents us. It's the story of creating us. It's the story of creating the world and the universe. And it's the story of creating the spirit world and the unseen world. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, it says, remember this is Yeshua's body, right? Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 says, Yeshua created everything, both seen and unseen, out of himself. Out of him, out of his very essence. Everything was made by him, for him, and through him, or with him. Okay? Now, the rabbis have determined that every time you see the word Elohim in the original Hebrew, in Genesis chapter 1, it's a creative force is going forth. And whenever, okay, I'll read it. Each time God's name Elohim appears anywhere, it is used to define some act of creation. The verses where God's name Elohim appears without the, without the word of said, saw, or made represents one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew language. So you will see basically the, you know, you go in, you know, reading the original manuscripts, when you see Elohim by itself, it's creating one of these letters. Okay? In other words, it's creating a part of you. Okay? When a verse uses the word said and Elohim together, this additional condition represents the creating of a sea for rope. So that happens ten times in Genesis chapter 1. Okay? When a verse states Elohim made, this additional condition represents one of the three mother letters, Aleph, Mem, and Sheen. This is Sheen, horizontal connection. Aleph, horizontal connection. Mem, horizontal connection. So it's making one one of those letters three happens three times okay when a verse states Elohim saw this additional condition represents the seven double letters or doublet letters bait gimel dalit kof pei reish tom and if you don't study Hebrew you won't you don't know what the double letters mean and what that's going to produce when you read the scriptures but basically you have three horizontal okay three horizontal connections then you have the doublets you have seven vertical connections two four six and the seven down there and then the rest are diagonal. This is the story of creation. The creation of the world, our solar system, and us. And this is the body or tree of life, the body of Christ or the body of Moshiach. And everything was created by this, for this, okay, and out of this and through this anthropomorphic okay now let's take a look at Revelation chapter 21 and we're going to begin at verse 10 okay Shout out that page number since you got it. Help everybody out. 977. Revelation 21, 
begin at verse 10. Okay. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of the heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Revelate, um, relating everything to crystals again. Okay. Having the glory of God, you know, clear as crystal, and had a, had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations. In them, the names of the twelve of apostles of the land. Let's make this anthropomorphic based on Revelation chapter 22 and also Genesis chapter 2. We have four walls, right? North, south, east, and west. Those four walls are our four, wind, four limbs. Okay? Two arms and two legs. What is on each arm? An energy gateway. Okay? There are six energy gateways on each arm. Six energy gateways on each leg. Mm -hmm. And we have the 12 gates. 3, 6, 9, 12. Okay. Anthropomorphically. Yes. He, remember, this is the new temple, right? So those of you who say, ah, oh, yeah, ain't making that up. Blah, blah, blah. This, it, you know, the new temple where we're going to worship. Who is the temple of the Ruach HaKodesh? Sure. Huh? God. Who? God, sure. Nah. Yeah, there's truth in that. Yeah, Who also is the temple? I said us. 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 You are the temple of the Ruach HaKodesh. You have 12 gates. You have four walls or four entrances. Don't think of a wall. Think of four entrances by which energy can come into your body. I'm going to show them this. Is that okay? I was wondering whether that, that looked kind of pornographic almost I'm sorry. from here. <laughs> I was like, what? what? Do I want to? Yeah, well, in the okay. So, really, what this is talking about, and this is not the only, I'm just giving the anthropomorphic interpretations here. They have all the other traditional interpretations that you may have ever learned or knew about as well. Okay? And I'll explain that in a minute. So, this here in Revelation chapter 21, beginning at verse 10, is talking about us again. Anthropomorphic. We have four ways for energy to come into our body. Four walls. And on each one, the gates. Six gates on the arms. Six gates on the legs. For a total of twelve. Just like in Genesis, it branched out into four branches. And the Holy Spirit nourished the four of them. And then what, what was in that nourishment, that nourishing water? Crystals. What is the foundation here? Crystals. Twelve crystals. Which come up 
and nourish everything. Okay? Gold, remember, New Jerusalem has streets of gold. So you have a street, you know, we're walking around on gold, pure gold streets. Everybody buys a little gold to wear on their finger, around their neck. We're going we're gonna to be walking on pure gold in New Jerusalem. What is gold? Scientifically. What is it good for? What? What? Conducting electricity. Conducting energy. Electricity or otherwise. It is a good conductor. You know, on stereo, they say, you know, you can buy more, experio, uh, more expensive stereo con connections that are gold tipped. Okay? It's an excellent conductor of energy. What energy is it conducting? Based here on scripture. Read it. You got a Bible? Read it out loud. And tell me. Look at verse. I'm going to tell you where to look. Verse 14. Read verse 14, Enoch. Nice and loud and clear. And the wall of the city, louder, louder. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve Shechem of the land. Okay. Shilakim is uh, Aramaic or Hebrew for apostle. What I'm looking for, um, oh, I tell you what, go read, okay. It had 12 foundations and in the names, and in them the names of the apostles or the Shilakim. Read verse 19, ni nice and loud. Verse 19. Uh, and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was Jasper, the second Sapphire, the third Agate, and the fourth Emerald. Okay. What is that gold conducting? The streets of gold, what is it conducting? Precious stones? The energy from the stones. The reason why I have crystals around the house is not because I like rocks. Okay? There is an energy, a vibration being given off. There is wavelength and frequency. Each type of crystal has its own energy signature. So that 12 of them is going up into the streets of gold. So as you're walking, you're being nourished by those crystals and their energy signatures just as it is describing in Revelation chapter 22 verses 1 and 2 when a river comes out like crystal that nourishes the two trees of life. For healing. We can use it for healing now. Just like Adam was nourished because he drank water from those four branches, from that really from that one source that broke in the four branches and war remember it watered the garden. So he drank the water, it watered the plants. Anthropomorphic. Genesis chapter twenty two, verses one and two. Not Genesis, Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 21, beginning at verse 10 and reading down to verse 19. Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 10. Give you one more anthropomorphic description. Go to Revelation. Chapter 4.
Get this amen. Shout out the page number. Help somebody out. Amen. Amen. Okay. This is Yokanon. John. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet. Actually, in the original Aramaic it says shofar, talking with me. Because we know in uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse 10, it says Yeshua's voice is as, in Hebrew, in Aramaic, it says Yeshua's voice is as the sound of a mighty shofar. You know, not a Louis Armstrong trumpet or Wynton Marcellus, you know, coronet or whatever. Okay. He said, he heard as it were a shofar talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And on the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. It does not say which belong to that there were seven spirits that belong to him. It says they are the seven spirits of God. Okay? Whose image are we made in? If God has seven spirits, then we have to have seven spirits. Because we're made in his image. Amen? Amen. Okay? I just want to say to you out there listening, hear me. Don't fear me. Hear me. Don't fear me. What might those seven spirits look like in us? Emotions? Huh? Emotions? Possible. They could control an emotion. Matter of fact, I believe they do. Okay? I mean, I already know. But, more precisely... You want me to say it? Go ahead. The auras. Our seven auras. What's the clue that it's the seven auras? They burn brightly... Before the throne. Fire. The, la the, the lamb, right. as it had been slain, Yeshua, sits on the throne. The seven lamps burn brightly before the throne. Our auras burn before us in seven layers. Completely around us. Okay? Not just on one side. In front of us, in back of us. On top of us, on the side of us, and underneath us. And they, you know, they precede us. This is the reason why you can meet a person. And from across the room, you're going, mm-mm. Not that fool. Because your aura mm -hmm. is interacting with their aura. Or as some new age people will say sometimes, you're in, you're in their energy field. Or they're in your energy field. You feel funny around them. You're feeling what they feel. You know, they don't have happy feelings or whatever. And you just, hmm. And sometimes you have to give people a second chance. You have to see what... Let me look at, let me try to see them the way God sees them. Because right now they're giving me the creeps. And sometimes some people, somebody, somebody can say something to you 
and you might get all upset. And they really didn't say anything that, that should really make you upset. But sometimes your spirit knows what they really meant or, or said. And it's your spirit is informing you that Don't. your spirit is grieved or, or, or what have you. There's, there's some type, you know, I can't explain this precisely to you. I can, can I just go ahead and give you something real quick? Yeah, go ahead, sure. And the definition of aura, if you look it up, it has several definitions. Um, the di one is the distinctive atmospheric quality that seems to surround and be generated by a person, thing, or place. It uses says thing or place. Two, in spiritualism, and some forms of alternative medicine, it's a supposed emanation surrounding the body of a living creature and regard it as an essential part of the individual. And as you read on and you say uh, questions people ask, it says, what is the aura and what is its purpose? It says, auras are energy fields that provide information about your life, expert soul desire. Uh, some say that they can be red. Um, that's what I was going to. The rarest, the rarest color. What the rarest is the colors. The rarest aura color, white, is the rarest of all aura colors. It indicates a high level of spirituality and purity affiliated with the crown chakra. The people with white auras have access to heightened states of consciousness and wisdom and intuition. And remember when we had our aura reading with our friend uh, Carolyn, mm -hmm. Carolyn Back in Shreveport. Right, Shreveport. Um, she saw, as soon as you had the tefillin on, the w white appeared. When I put on my tefillin. When you put on your tefillin, the color white appeared in your aura, in the top mm. of the head, in the crown chakra. Okay. That was, that's significant, so you need to know. We had a very good friend in Shreveport um, who could actually read your aura. You know, um, the auras can be seen with special photographic or energetic equipment. And she knew how to interpret it. Carolyn Freeman. Carolyn Freeman in Shreveport. I have to get in touch with her. She knew how to interpret auras. Didn't she do the kids? Or, yeah, or, she did the kids. Okay. She did okay, she did mainly Kandesi. I don't know what we did with those because she gave us a printout of it. and. I think we saved it on our computer or something. Okay. Like, have have it. Has photos of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, also in the Bible it says that the seven spirits of God run to and fro all the earth. they searching for who he may show himself strong to. Mm -hmm. His aura or spirit searches out your aura and spirit to see if it's agreeable to his. And if it is, he'll be, on, you know, on your side. Show himself strong to you. Mm -hmm. Okay? Well, I might as well finish. I was going to try and keep this to an hour, but it seems like if I stop it seems it's like very a, good. if I stop, it's I'll mess up. An hour and a half is, per, is really good. I might endure another half hour, but we don't want to lose it. Okay. Place. All right. Let me let me let me go on then. So, when we look now, that rainbow going around the throne. Remember, there's seven colors in the rainbow. There's seven spirits around the throne. You must have light to produce a rainbow. It is the seven spirits that produce the rainbow around the throne. Okay. Anthropomorphically, we know that the seven spirits are the seven spirits of God and our seven spirits or our rainbow yeah. or our seven lamps of fire. This whole scene here, the, the whole chapter of Revelation chapter 4, let's break it down. Okay? We have the 24 elders. How can 24 elders be anthropomorphic? I don't know. <laughs> I've always, now this is kind of a guess here. I've always pictured the 24 elders as 12 being on one side of the throne and 12 being on the other. Even if they circle it mm -hmm. completely, they're, you know, even they're not all bunched up over here. Yeah. Okay? 24 elders. The 12 meridians. 
they represent the 12 meridians. The seven spirits of God are our auras. The 24 elders are our 12 bilateral meridians. What about the throne itself? Now we, we flip into a picture of the 10 Sephiroth and how the right brain, which is Yeshua, the left brain, with, you know, and remember, the right brain is the creative side. That's what creates. Okay? The left is our powerful side. You know, they can do calculus and all that good stuff. And then the Keter encapsulates it all. All right? And we had that sea of glass, the crystals again. So the throne is issuing forth. Remember, out of the, out of the throne, yeah. lightnings, thunderings. It sits on a sea of glass, just like it did in Revelation 22, and the river poured out and everything. Okay, so now the 24 elders out of meridians. What represents what do the four living creatures or the four beasts represent? Four limbs. That's a tough one, but it's the four limbs. Because, remember, it is an angel with the head of a man the head of an eagle, the head of a lion, and the head of an ox. Mm -hmm. Okay, For better, more descriptive on that, you have to go to the first chapter of Ezekiel. See how many wings they had. You're, you're going to kind of come up with that 24. Each one of them had six wings. Six, twelve. Okay. Yes, 18, 24. That 24 comes in there. They each had six wings. And then they, they had hands. You can't follow it in your head. Okay. It represents the four limbs because they do things. Your arms and your legs, you do things. They each had six wings. Just like your arm has six, each arm has six meridians. Each leg has six meridians. Twenty-four. It is, and the 24 elders, it's a repeat of the same thing. It's, you know, and you may not, you, you, this has been years in the making in me, okay? And you're going to have to let some of this sink in. And plus, you need to study auras and chakras on top of that, all right? If you don't know anything about auras, you don't know anything about chakras, you don't know anything about meridians, it's almost, I, I, I might be kidding myself to think that you're going to get this. You're going to have to study this. You're going to have to study meridians, chakras, auras, all of that good stuff. You're going to have to study uh, genealogy, DNA, to get it. I majored in, you know, in chemistry in college, and I can kind of handle some of this. But it's all anthropomorphic. It says in Ezekiel, why, I don't know, for some reason. I'm don't go to Ezekiel. That, that whole chapter is describing know, it says, those angels. It says those four living creatures are described as having only four wings. But in Revelation, the four living beings have six wings. Okay. Oh, well. I don't know if that's correct. We got they grew two more wings. Remember, <laughs> the, remember, the new was in the old concealed. They were hiding two. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Okay. They were hiding two of them. You know, he, Ezekiel was drunk. He only saw four wings. Okay. That's interesting. You know, Whatever. Yeah. Okay. So you got the four bees. And do you understand why? So the man, the ox, and the lion, and the eagle. I just assume because of the war, Rabbi the power. Of war, Rabbi Dr. James Scott Trim describes that as the four Gospels. How uh, um, one Gospel is more like the servant. The ox is the servant. 
and you know the eagle is going to be more prophetic one of the gospels has a little bit more of a prophetic side yeah. one more uh, has you know this side or that side Lion. so he he, he says Luke would be man or Luke be, Matthew be man I have to pull Matthew out that would be man. okay you might change that I don't know okay <laughs> Because I, I, I've looked at him. I can see that. I, I can see, of course, the eagle has to be John. Okay. I have read that and thought about it. Do I agree with him? I think he's on the right track. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whether or not I agree that the ox is Matthew and the eagle is this, mm -hmm. you know, is John, I'm not sure. I, I have to read. Really, what I'd have to do is sit down when I was reading that book. If I really wanted to nail it down, I'd have to sit down and read the four Gospels again and okay. see what the Spirit said to me about okay. it. But it represents that. Okay, go to Revelations 5. We're in the home stretch. Home stretch. Okay. Go ahead and start at verse 1. I'll start at verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now what is, what are we talking about here so far? Mainly, seven seals, okay? And the Lamb. Seven seals. And behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a Lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Okay, we get a little further description of Revelation chapter 4. Okay, and now it talks in the midst a lamb having seven horns. Now I'm not saying Yeshua is up in heaven with seven horns in his, coming out of his head. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm trying to say. But if you know something about chakras, chakras are all tied into the head. Yep. And they run down the front of the body. Down to um, just below your pubic symphysis bone. Okay? Now, if you know about biblical imagery, if you studied that part, what do horns represent? Take a guess. You guys can get this. Take a guess. What does a horn represent? Okay. But a horn. Think of it. Think of all the animals that you know of that have a horn. Huh? Strong. Power. You got it. A rhinoceros. You don't want that horn to hit you. A long horn, you know, bull. You don't want to catch you don't want to catch one of those horns. Okay? A bull. You don't want to you don't want to get hooked with, with the horn. Power. Uh, you probably biblically a horn represents a kingdom. It represents authority. Okay? But you said power. Do you know what the definition of a, of a chakra is? We talked about auras. We know auras burn, you know, out in front of you. It's like a glow. Do you know what chakras are? Huh? 
a center of power. And how many does Yeshua have? Seven. Seven. So how many centers of power do we have? Seven. Seven. Where are they? They're in the midst. We know that the seven spirits or the chakras burn before the throne. But on, in, on the Lamb himself, he has the seven horns in the midst of himself. The chakras are in our midst. They run down the center of our body. From the front all the way out to the back. Anthropomorphically. It said that how many seals were on the book that he wanted to see open? Seven. Where were they? Huh? On the right hand of them? No, read, read it. Just read it. On the it. back side? On the what side? The back side. Where else? Within. Huh? Within and on the back side. Within and on the back side. Okay, let me... Okay, I, let me... You're reading ever. And I saw a strong angel proclaim with a loud voice who was worthy to open up the book. Okay. First one I saw, the right hand of him it sat on the throne, a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. Written within and on the back side. They're in, they're in us. They come out the back. Okay? So anthropomorphically, we know that that scene in Revelation chapter 4, we have the seven auras, we have the seven chakras, we have four limbs, we have the... Um, the 12 meridians on each side, which are represented by the 24 elders. That's pretty powerful. And when you look at this, you have to take Genesis chapter 2, verse 10. Okay? Then you have to overlay it with Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. Then you have to overlay that, and it can be in any order. And you have to overlay that with Revelation chapter 21, verses 10 to 19. Then you have to overlay that with Revelation chapter 4. And then Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, really all the way down to 12. Because it talks about the seven spirits having a name. Go to, go to verse 12 real quick. I'm just going to read Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain, the Lamb, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, blessings. Now you know what I got that when we light the menorah. Mm -hmm. The menorah of Yeshua. Okay? That's refer in reference to the chakras and the auras. Right there. So you, you're you going to overlay Revelation 22, 21, 5, 4, and Genesis 2. You see those things, you buy, you buy them and you tilt them, and one image comes forward, then you tilt it another way, and a, another oh, image, man. you know, they, they go like that. You're going to, you have to keep like a holographic Interp a holographic a holographic anthropomorphic graphic and then out of that you got to superimpose in that the ten sefero and even the tetragrammaton the yo he vav -he. and whenever appropriate the spirit will have which image to come out at you to give you the right interpretation or for me to give me the right prescription to help this person heal. Everything you saw was vibrational, the crystals. I'm going to talk, you know, all of everything that I just gave you was all about sight, sound, color, crystals, essential oils from the plants, all of that. Okay? 
It's the biblical basis for holistic healing. For you know what we call crystal healing, aromatherapy with essential oils, um, everything associated with uh, acupuncture or oriental medicine, herbology, light therapy, sound therapy. It is all there. All of it. You have to really go and study those chapters. Anthropomorphic. And I'm going to end right here. Who is the Word of God? Yeshua. Yeshua. Jesus. He is the Word. He created everything using the word, using the 22 letters of the Aleph Bay. What else is Yeshua? He's the word. What else? Can someone tell me what I'm looking for? Huh? Re in relationship to words, what else is he? Teacher. What? Teacher. No, in relationship to words. The Hebrew alphabet. Oh, Aleph Tav. The Aleph Tav. Don't you mean? Okay, the, which is the Aleph Bet, the Word of God. All right. What else in relationship to Word? The beginning and the end. That's the Aleph Tav. I'll tell you. He's the Torah. Oh, okay. The Torah. Yes. Okay. The written Word of God. Okay. He is the Torah. The first five books of the Bible. The Pentateuch. The five books of Moses. Right. He's the Torah. In the Torah, the rabbis have delineated 613 mitzvah or commandments. 613. A mitzvah is a commandment. According to traditional rabbinical literature, there are 613, not 10, but a total of 613. 248 of them are positive. Thou shall do this. Thou shall do that. 365 of them are called negative. Don't do this. Don't do that. For a total of 613. Okay. Who is the word of God? Yeshua. Yeshua. What is the word of God? The Torah. The Torah. Okay. Who is the Torah? Yeshua. Yeshua. Whose image are we made in? God. God. Is Yeshua God? Yes. Okay. We're made in his image, right? So, so that 613 mitzvahs represents us anthropomorphically they represent our body rabbinical Hasidic you know the Hasidic rabbis are the ones you know the, the Hasidic or Hasidim they wear the white shirts and the black jackets they always wear a black suit every day mm -hmm. you don't know if they got one or a hundred Till you smell it, or whatever. Okay, no, just kidding. And and the black hat, right? Mm -hmm. That's Hasidic Jews. Hasidic rabbis believe that those six hundred and thirteen commandments represent a part of your body. Because we're made in his image. So we have to have 600, you know, and the 613 mitzvahs are part of Yeshua. So we have to have those 613 mitzvahs or commandments represented in our body somehow. And they say, if you want to be healed, you need to discern which one of those 613 or combination of them is responsible for you being sick. When you discern which ones 
it means that you have not been performing them very well or you need to double down on it for some reason. You know, if it requires giving, you need to step up your giving. If it requires more prayer, you need to do more prayer, more whatever it is. There was a, uh, they tell the story of a rabbi who lived in England during modern times. And he would go to the doctor and he would only allow the doctor to diagnose him what was wrong with him. He would not accept any treatment, just a diagnosis. Because he knew this doctrine. It's written down in a couple of books. One of them is called the Sefer Charedim. That's C-H-A-R-E-I-D-I-M. Sefer Charedim or Haredim. You might see it, print, you know, spell C-H. You might just see H. But C-H-A-R-E-I-D-I-M. Called the Book of the Pious. And in there, it gives some. It, um, no one knows exactly which mitzvah corresponds exactly to which body part. You have to discern it. You, you know, you use some principles. It give a clue as to a few. And then it's up to you to discern which mitzvah corresponds to the part of your body that is not functioning properly. Shifar, Sifar, Chawadim, the book of the pious. pious. Mm -hmm. And there's another book of a rabbi who did something like that called Pri Yeshak. P-R-I, first word, and Yeshak. Yitzchak, Y I T Z C H A K. Only problem you can find you can read, readily find the Sefer Charadim, but it hasn't been. I don't know. A couple of years ago, it, it wasn't. Hopefully, maybe somebody has done it. Uh, it hasn't been translated out of Hebrew. You know, the rabbis they love to do that. They they don't like to transfer uh, translate their works. They like to keep those things kind of secret to themselves. So, anthropo you know, the Torah is anthropomorphic. It represents your entire body from Genesis to Deuteronomy and all the mitzvahs or commandments therein. And if you're sick or have a problem, you need to find out why. Now, what does that do? Like the biblical astrology. You got to read the Bible. Mm -hmm. Now, this is all part of Kabbalah. So for those of you who say Kabbalah is witchcraft, all of the main teachings and things that Kabbalah teaches requires intense, you know, intense biblical study. And people out there claim it's witchcraft because they heard it from somebody. It's intense biblical study in order to uncover what God has healed. It's for kings. Amen. Meditation. And meditation. On the word. Meditation is not witchcraft. It is not evil to meditate. Anyway. It it's about to say something. Okay. Almost two dollars. I'll be I'll be closing in a couple of minutes. Just like biblical astrology, which Kabbalah uses quite heavily, astrology, it requires intense biblical study, intense Torah study and meditation. Not only of Torah, but of the Psalms, 
the writings, the prophets, and the historical books. All of that. So that you better understand the 613 that you're reading. There is a book by Rabbi Nachman. He's a, a, you know, a Hasidic master. Rabbi Nachman of Breslau. He has written down the spiritual interpretation of Jewish halakha or Jewish law. The spiritual interpretation of it. See, what's going on with halakha when you read it, a lot of it just seems stupid. It's just, in Christianity, we like to say legalism. But the Jews believe that there is a deep spiritual component going on that is not readily available. And they will tell you, we do them because they believe they're commanded to do them out of the Talmud. We don't, we don't say we understand them. Some of them we may understand, but might, not necessarily all. But we do them because we're obedient, not because we know exactly what's going on. And they do them, believe me. So if you're going to say that Kabbalah is demonic, then you have to say every Hasidic Jew, every Jew that you see, every single one of them, is doing nothing but practicing witchcraft. The men and the women. You have to say that. Because they literally swim and soak in Kabbalah every minute of the day. Their teachings and beliefs are Kabbalistic. And we do not we don't we don't see demonic behavior out of it. We see a lot of stuff that we don't agree with, but we don't see no demonic behavior out of it. No more than you see in Christians. So, whew, the revelation that God gave me this morning when I was going over all this to present to you, and I don't, it's going to take me years to do it. Discerning, when you learn Oriental medicine, you look at people's symptoms and different things and the energetic state of their pulse to determine what's wrong with them. With the Sefar Charadim, you read the 613 mitzvah. Okay? One can interpret the other. The 613 mitzvah can help interpret what's going on energetically and the 12 meridians can interpret what's going on spiritually because if you learn to make that connection oh, oh this is what's going on energetically or physically in this person's body that means that spiritually they need to do uh, commandment number three, and they got them numbered. They're 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 numbered. They, you know, they didn't just count them and went on their way. They're numbered in order: the 248 positive ones, and the 365 negative ones. You know, if you say number 55, you know, they all know what number 55 is. Okay, one can interpret the other. You can do a physical diagnosis using Oriental medicine. And then you can come over to that person and say, spiritually, here's where your issue lies as well to help people get healed. You attack it from both ends. Amen? Amen. And I just pray that God gives me long life so that I can study these things out and give me the time, and, you know, to put these things together to synthesize them and synergize them to bring about healing. Yeshua knew all this. When he prayed for a person, he had that knowledge. His intent, okay, I'm, I'm going to clear up this meridian. I'm going to clear out this aura. 
I'm going to infuse this chakra. He had all of that in his intent. He had all that knowledge. He knew the 613 and what they related to. When he healed the man at the pool of Bethesda, what did he say? Go and sin no more before a worse thing come upon you. Man knew what his sin was. He was talking about which one of the 613. He had authority over all that. He had that knowledge that he opened up to us in Revelations 22, 21, 5, and 4, and Genesis now, chapter 2. So he, yeah, he could say, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Because in his mind, in his spirit, in his intent, he was commanding the forces of nature, okay, clear out the meridians, blow out the chakras, clear out the auras, and forgive him of this sin. Because what did you say? Is it easier to say, rise, take up thy bed, and walk, or thy sins be forgiven thee? He had all that knowledge. It's not that I don't heal the way Moshiach healed. I just don't know everything he knew. There was so much more authority because there was so much more knowledge so that when he spoke something, he didn't have to say everything. You know, I got to go. I got to put needles in there. I got to pray that this meridian is okay and give him some herbs Give him, you know, some essential oils, give me some crystals, uh, um, you know, try to find out what, you know, what, what, do you, what do you, what's your lifestyle like? What you doing? He knew all that. So when he spoke, he was such a powerful, multi-dimensional being. And we're multi-dimensional also, but he was... All that was going through his mind and being transmuted by his words. The young centurion that came to him and asked him to heal his servant, and Yeshua said, okay, let's go to the house. And the, young, the centurion said, you know, I'm a man of authority. I can tell that you're a man of authority. All you got to do is speak the word, and my servant will be healed. Because he, you know, he understood the Roman Empire. You know, he said, I tell somebody to go and they go. I tell them to come and they come. Because I got, I got that authority from Caesar back in Rome. It runs on an entire empire. He recognized the fact that Yeshua was in charge of a kingdom, just like Caesar was in charge of a kingdom and had complete authority and rule over it and that all Caesar had to do was say the word in Rome and somebody in Greece would drop you know would drop would be dead he knew and could see that in Yeshua didn't know anything about Torah but he knew authority he knew how it works that nothing happens without a command structure. You know, so Yeshua could speak it because he understood the commands. He created it all. The Bible says nothing was, he created everything for his own use, demons and everything for his own use. Everything was created for him, by him, and out of him. One last thing, real quick. Talking about the I Ching. We have talked about that 64. And how the I Ching is just reading that signature that's already in your DNA. It's picking it up with your intent. What is the Tensi Faro called also? The 32 paths of wisdom, which is the body of God. How many trees are in the garden? How many trees are in New Jerusalem? 
two in the garden, two in New Jerusalem. 32 paths of wisdom, wisdom. 32 paths of understanding, knowledge, and wisdom in a body. 64. Amen. 64 codons. Mm -hmm. Believe it right there. That's deep. May the blessings of our risen Savior. Is there any comments you want to stay on for a while? Or? No, that was great. I'm just okay. thinking like, praise God. Okay. Just thank God. It's May awesome. the blessings of our risen Savior, Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach, be upon you. Thank you. I'll see you next week. Okay.